Hello, this is sermon number 16 from True Love Chapel, uh, based out of Las Vegas, Nevada. This is truelovechapel.com, um, teaching and preaching through the ESV Study Bible Reading Plan. And uh, please check us out on the web and uh, find out what's going on. Uh, let's get going. We're going to be in Galatians this week. This is going out uh, April 24th, 2016. Almighty God, please be with us. Thank you for being with us. And please bless me in my teaching. Please let it be you speaking to us through me, through, the, through your word. Let us, let us learn from you. I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, so Galatians. We're covering the entire book of Galatians um, this week, kind of just an overview, and then I'll have a message on one section of it. There's only like uh, six chapters, I think. Not a very long book. But uh, hopefully you read it, read through the book following the, the reading plan. So, uh, so you'll be familiar with it. Now, Galatians was another epistle written by Paul. He wrote a lot of them, didn't he? And uh, he was writing to the churches of Galatia. Um, we can see in chapter 1, verse 2, he's talking about that. To the churches of Galatia. Now, Galatia was, a, it was not a city, it was a, a territory in uh, what is now modern-day Turkey. And he also called them Foolish Galatians, chapter 3, verse 1. Oh, foolish Galatians. So Paul is writing to these uh, foolish Christian Galatians in, uh, in this territory of Galatia. Well, what makes them so foolish? We're going to find out. First, a little background. Um, this was most likely written in A.D. 48. Um, Paul argues in this letter that the, that the uh, Gentiles should not be circumcised. But he does not mention the Jerusalem Council of A.D. 48-49, which would, made a, would have made his argument stronger. So this letter was most likely written before the, the Jerusalem Council, which you can read about in Acts chapter 15. And since Paul evangelized South Galatia in A.D. 47 to 48, we can, um, we can guess pretty accurately that this letter was written uh, towards the end of that period, around A.D. 48. So the theme, the theme of Galatians, um, that Christ's death, burial, and resurrection brought in the new, the age of the new covenant. So it's different from the old covenant. There's a, you have to break from the old and em, embrace the new covenant, which is taking place. Um, believers no longer need to follow the Old Testament Mosaic law. Um, <clears throat> currently, our justification is by faith alone which is an incredible, amazing thing, actually. And um, that's the situation that we're living in today. We're in the church age that under the new covenant where justification is by faith in Christ alone. And it does not depend on our ability or lack thereof to follow the law, which is good because none of us are able to follow the law. So, uh, under the New Covenant, believers are to live under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. You know, it's... Okay, the background here. Paul is, uh, he's very critical of his audience here in Galatians, more so than in any other book or any other letter that he wrote. I mean... He's calling them foolish Galatians, you know, as we just mentioned. It's, 
so forth. Why was he so hard on them? Well, the Galatians had been led astray from the true gospel. They were led astray by false teachers who, t- who taught them a new form of Christianity, which was actually false Christianity. Um, they, the, the false teachers were teaching that the believers needed to be circumcised and that they needed to follow the Mosaic law of the Old Testament. Sort of setting up a, a new Jewish, Jewish sect you know, in which they were the leaders of it, those false teachers. And um, obviously Paul was very concerned, very uh, troubled by this development. Um, I mean, there are a lot. I'll just add that there, we're still dealing with the same thing today, aren't we? Because Christianity, the true gospel of Christ, is often misunderstood what we have is a barrage of false doctrines, false teachers and everything where people think that um, that you're justified by being a good person you know you didn't kill anyone you're basically a good person so that you're gonna go to heaven that's that's often taught that's a very uh, uninformed view Uh, also even within churches, a lot of churches are teaching sort of a works-based thing. Um, I'm sorry to call you out, but the, uh, the Catholics, you know, they're following uh, sort of a work and faith type thing. So it's, I guess I shouldn't be sorry to call you out. If, if you're doing, if they're teaching false doctrine, bad doctrine, then people need to know about it. And <clears throat> with uh, True Love Chapel, I mean, it's not about being politically correct. I'm here to, to speak the truth, to teach the Bible. And the Bible is saying that we are justified by faith alone. The, Catholics, the Catholic Church is saying a lot of stuff that's not true, like that we need to, to have uh, works in addition to that, which is not right. Um, also, when in this letter, Paul is saying that if, if anyone teaches you a, a, a gospel different from what, from what he taught. <clears throat> okay, here we go. Chapter 1, verse 6. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. <clears throat> Not that there is another one, but that there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. What is an example of that? The, uh, the Mormon church is an example of a, a movement where they claim that an angel revealed to them a different gospel from what is preached, from what Paul preached, from what is, what is clearly explained here in the, in the Bible. And so, it should not be believed. You know, we're so lucky, so blessed. I would say we are so blessed to have the Bible, to have the Holy Bible. You know, this is an English Standard Version. There are a lot of good uh, versions out there. Uh, NASB is one. New King James Version. I I would stick with those three, probably more than anything. But um. There are a lot of great Bible versions, you know, even in addition to those. Those are the ones that I use. But um, we're just so blessed to have the Bible. The, this is where our doctrine comes from. It's the Bible, the whole Bible, and nothing but the Bible. Anything else, 
we're not interested in. All these false religions, false movements, it's, just, it's generally, it's, it's the Bible and what? And something else. Like they'll claim that they have some special prophet who has some revelation that we don't know about. Or that some guy wrote another book that is just like the Bible. All of this is just nonsense. It is the Bible, the whole Bible, and nothing but the Bible. That is where truth is found. And that is what we base our uh, doctrine off of. So, now the false teachers back here in uh, Galatia, they were... They had the approval of the Jewish authorities for basically because they were converting people to Judaism. And so they were able to escape persecution that the Christians were facing. So they kind of had a very comfortable situation to be in. Um, and, I mean, they got to be the leaders of a new movement, giving them power and authority. I mean... Today, too, often the false teachers are the ones who are in the most comfortable position. They're um, well-esteemed. They make tons of money, at least here in America. A lot of false, a lot of big, famous false teachers are very successful here. And uh, usually if you're teaching the, the true gospel, you're not that, you're not that big, you know. People don't. Uh, aren't that accepting of you. You're usually kind of marginalized or, you know, whatever. You, you make less money, you have less popularity, probably. Um, <clears throat> I mean, today, how hard is it to find a church that teaches sound doctrine? And how hard is it to find a church that practices what they preach? I find churches today, Christian churches, generally have one of two things wrong. Either they're teaching false doctrines outright, or they're teaching sound doctrine, but they just don't seem to really be living it out. They're not practicing what they preach. So, and that one's hard to understand. How can their Bible teaching be so good but their, uh, their love is just feels lacking, you know. There's just this lack of care. Um, I don't understand that. And uh, also, how hard is it to find a Christian congregation that is not divided by hypocrisy? Or is not completely hypocritical, you know. You'd be lucky to find a few in most congregations. I mean, being hard on them, maybe. But I, I just wish that we could, we could grow up as Christians, you know, that we don't continue in this infancy for our whole lives, that we need to really grow up and be strong men and women of the faith, living it out, practicing what we preach, loving each other, having an intimate fellowship with God through the Holy Spirit, and having that spirit working in us and through us. Which is kind of what the sermon is going to be about here. I mean, and again, today we're faced with uh, a lot of confusion. People don't really understand this justification by faith alone. Usually they think that's a license for them to sin. Which is called antinomianism. Big fancy word, right? where you think that you're free to sin because you're justified by faith. The, the opposite end of the spectrum would be legalism, where you think that nothing is really allowed, everything is sinful, and you're scared to do anything. The truth is somewhere in the middle. Um, it's in, following the spirit of the law, it's a balance between the letter of the law, the spirit of the law, the freedom we have in Christ, but it's it's not a specific formula, though, either, because, well, okay, most people think that, they're, that good works are what's going to get them into heaven, and they think that because they, 
they lack the faith to really believe. It's hard for them to, to really imagine that the God of the universe is a personal God, powerfully involved in the lives of believers. So all of these formulas are missing one thing. They're missing God, right? They're saying you have to do it this way or that way to be saved like it's a formula. I do this, I get saved. They're, they're discounting, discrediting the fact that God himself is active and alive and involved. I mean, God is spirit. Those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And uh, God is involved in the lives of his people. So this almighty God will actually come and live inside the believers of Jesus Christ. And that is... Uh, that is the good news. That is your guarantee that you are a child of God. Your guarantee that you will be raised. You will be resurrected into eternal life. And uh, the Holy Spirit is the first fruits of our inheritance as children of God. <clears throat> so, since God himself is living inside of us, right? No longer in the, the Holy of Holies of the temple of the Old Testament. Remember when Christ was crucified, the curtain was torn from top to bottom. That's symboli symbolically showing that the divide between God and man has, has been broken through Christ. And that through Christ now, all of us have access to God. It's not only the high priest. We are all, you could say we're all priests. I mean, Christ himself is our high priest uh, after the order of Melchizedek. But we are also, you know, intimately acquainted with God or intimately joined with God. God is living inside of us. Our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And so, with God Almighty, who is holy, living inside of us, you know, it's only natural that we will also do good works. That is a byproduct of the relationship that we have with God through Christ. So you can say faith without works is dead because it's not real faith. A real faith results in the Holy Spirit living inside of you. And that will result in good works. That will be alive when you have that. The living, <clears throat> the living activity of God in you, it will result in good works. And you could say that the good in you is not you, it's God. And there's nothing that we can do that's good enough to get to, get to heaven. We get to heaven just by accepting God, accepting the gift of Christ, the sacrifice Christ made for us on the cross. Then entering into this relationship with God, accepting the Holy Spirit, you know, receiving the Holy Spirit to live inside of you. And that will be that, that voice, that still small voice can sometimes be a shout, but it's that thing leading you to God, causing you to desire the things of God, causing you to dislike sin, you know, or at least feel guilty if you sin and then you want to repent and pray for forgiveness. Um, unbelievers are, are not even concerned with the things of God, but we are. And the reason we are concerned is because of the Holy Spirit living in us. And if you can say that Jesus is the Son of God, Jesus is Lord, then it's only by the Holy Spirit that you're able to say that. It's not us. Our good works, our good deeds are nothing. Like in Isaiah chapter 64, verse 6, we have all become like one who is unclean, and all of our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. We all fade like a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, take us away. <clears throat> it's only faith in Christ that saves us. 
In Galatians 2, verse 16, he says, uh, Yet we know that a person is not just justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by works of the law no one will be justified. It's faith. Faith in Jesus Christ is what justifies you. Justifies you, and it would be just as if I had never sinned. So you're justified before God. We rest solely on the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Our hope is in Christ, not in us. That's uh, the Christian life. We are not made righteous by our works. We are not made more righteous by our works. There's nothing about our works that makes us righteous. It's only we are positionally righteous because of our our position in Christ. And Jesus Christ is righteous, not us. So with Christ, with the Spirit of Christ living in us, then the Holy Spirit living in us, God sees us as righteous and accepts us into eternal life because of His Son, Jesus. So let's go to Galatians chapter 2, verse 15 to 21. Justified by faith. We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by works of the law no one will be justified. But if in our endeavor to be justified in Christ we too are found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. For if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. For through the law I died to the law, so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. I love this passage. Let's go through it verse by verse. Verse 15 and 16. We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. They were not Gentile sinners. They were Jewish sinners. We're all sinners. At least they had some uh, knowledge of God, some attempt to, uh, to please God, but they were still sinners. Everyone is a sinner. Uh, no one has ever been able to keep the law except for Jesus Christ. He kept the entire law. So the purpose of the law was n not even that people could keep it. The purpose was for people to realize how sinful they were. To expose sin. And when, <clears throat> when you realize how sinful you are, then you realize that you need a Savior. And... That opens the, uh, the door for you to be saved, to let Christ in. So in Romans chapter 3, verse 20, For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. That's the purpose of the law, okay? It's to give the knowledge of sin. <clears throat> But, yet, verse 16, Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ, and not by works of the law. Because by works of the law no one will be justified. Got it? We're repeating it. We'll, we'll repeat it many thousands of times throughout your lifetime. Probably You're going to have to keep hearing that. And hopefully you'll get it <clears throat> sooner rather than later. Some people never get it. But look, we're justified through faith in Christ. 
We are counted righteous. God is not judging us at the final judgment. We're not judged according to our sins. We're judged whether we had a relationship with Christ or not. Whether the Holy Spirit was living in us or not. That's the, that is the question. I mean... So it's God. It's, it's what God has done for us that saves us. It's not our works of the law. It is what Christ did for us out of love for us. He died for us. And He's offering uh, eternal life to us as a free gift if we would only accept it. And all we need to do is believe. Put our faith in Christ. Trust Him for your eternal life. Enter into a relationship with Him. That's it. So verses uh, 17 and 18. But if in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too are found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. For if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. Now this one's tricky because... uh, we are all found to be sinners. Every single one of us sins every single day. Um, no matter how mature of a Christian you are, you're still going to be struggling with sin. Um, let's look at <clears throat> this great passage in Romans 7. Um, f- familiar passage, but let's just look at it again. Romans seven fourteen to 25. For we know that the law is spiritual, But I am of the flesh, sold under sin, for I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but the sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin who dwells within me. So I find it to be a law that that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God, in my inner being, but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind. But with my flesh, I serve the law of sin. Paul is definitely describing a struggle with sin. And, you know, we see here that the intentions of Paul's heart are good. He wants to do good. He, He delights in the law of God. But he doesn't have the ability to carry it out in his flesh and because of the the war that is taking place between the spiritual man and the flesh the old man the new man who is spiritual and the old man the old self which is flesh we're stuck in this already in between not yet kind of process where we are struggling with our flesh but that's okay That's normal. That's how it's supposed to be. And we're supposed to trust God, have faith, and see our faith grow through the trials, through the struggles and trials of this life. But the inner man is the one who who is taking over, you know. Even the outer man, you do things that you don't really want to do, but the inner man is spiritual. And that that's what's growing inside of you. The desire of the heart is what's important. I mean, do you have the, the desire in your heart for Christ? Do you want 
to follow Him and accept Him as your Savior and as Lord over all of your life? And uh, do you delight in the law of God? Do you delight in the Word of God? These are the kind of questions you need to, to ask yourself. In, uh, in verse 18, For if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. Now, what are you building in your life? To, to build something, you have to set your mind on it, and you have to put effort into it over a period of time. So an unbeliever does not even care about the things of God, and so their mind is set on themselves, bettering themselves, pleasing themselves. They're putting effort into building things up for themselves. Um, the, the believer, on the other hand, our self falls by the wayside and our desire is for Christ. Uh, we're willing to forsake our own lives in order to, to have this new life. And when you've drawn close to Christ, that's how powerful and amazing it is when you encounter the Holy Spirit in your life that you would be willing to to stop living for yourself, forsaking your own life in pursuit of this, uh, this new life in Christ Jesus. And so we're building up spiritual things. We're setting our mind on things above, not in the things of this earth. Our focus is heavenward. And though we will slip, but we are not utterly cast out. We slip, we get back up, and we get back on track. Um, and while we slip, we're not accepting of sin. We don't just embrace it or accept it or be comfortable with it. We're going to feel conviction in our lives because of the Holy Spirit living in us. And that's going to make us deal with sin. You know, it might take time to deal with it, and you may have many sins to deal with, and you will over your life. But because of the Holy Spirit, you will be confronted with these things and be forced to deal with them. God will, God will discipline you too to, to uh, bring it about, whatever is necessary. God will discipline you because you're His child. And just as you discipline a child so that they'll grow up right, God does the same thing for us. <clears throat> And, you know, in 1 John chapter 1, verses 8, and 10, verse 8 through 10, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make Him a liar, and His word is not in us. So... Yes, we have sin. If we say we don't have sin, then we make Him a liar and His Word is not in us because the Word is saying that we are sinful. If we believe God, we have faith in Him, then we're going to believe the Word of God, the Bible. And truly, we will know that we're sinners. That's one thing about Christians. We all know that we're sinners. True Christians. And... Uh, Unbelievers may, may be clueless to just how sinful they are, how much trouble they're actually in, or they just don't care. They don't know and they don't care. But believers know and we care. So, verse 20. <clears throat> I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. This is great. Such a powerful proclamation of truth and of our position in Christ. Uh, it is a witness and testimony to the reality of the new life that believers experience. Um, you know, the old self, the old self-centered self, that does not care about God, that old self who is a slave to sin, that we crucify with Christ when we become Christians, when we put our faith in Christ. 
and that old self, which is headed, was headed straight to hell, that old self has been crucified and is gone forever. I mean, um, though we still struggle with the flesh, but we're not struggling with the, um, the, old, the old self in the same kind of way. We're, we're struggling with flesh, but we're not struggling with this, this old self that doesn't care about God. Now that's over. That's gone. That's crucified. Now we do care about God. We do know God, and we are living for God. We are improving. Uh, we're fighting the spiritual warfare but we have, we have put on this new self. It's a new nature that we have, a spiritual nature in us, which is now headed straight to God, straight to Christ. It is drawn to Christ. Uh, we have the Holy Spirit living in us, and he will, God will never leave us nor forsake us. So we have eternal life, and we cannot lose it. Once the Holy Spirit is in you, you will not be lost. You will be saved. Thank God for that, for the assurance of that. And in verse, what's verse 21? Verse 21, I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. So to go back to living a, a life of works a life of a system of religion and trusting in that is to nullify the grace of God and if you could do that if you're trusting in those things if those could save you then Christ died for no purpose and obviously Christ died because he needed he needed to do that in order to save us there was no other way you know remember Christ prayed like uh, if it be possible take this cup from me but if there's you know nevertheless not my will but your be, will be done in the garden of Gethsemane so right before he was crucified Christ you know if it was possible any other way that's what would have happened but since there was no other way then Christ had to die and suffer on the cross for us and so that is what we need to put our trust in and our faith in. Not in our good works, not in a system of religion, but in the gospel of Jesus Christ, in the grace and truth of our Lord Jesus and the sacrifice that He made for us. That is what our hope is in. And by having that faith, that belief, that true truth in you, then you will receive the Holy Spirit. I mean, when you're, when you're a Christian, when you believe that Christ died for your sins and you accept it, you accept His sacrifice for yourself, for eternal life, you will have the Holy Spirit living in you. And I urge you to, to draw close to God, you know. Having the Spirit living in you is one thing, but embracing it is another and being filled to abundance with the Holy Spirit to where it takes over your life that's what that's the real beauty of Christianity being on fire with the Spirit and just seeing God do all these amazing things in your life through your life having a relationship with God where you can pray and He will answer and where you know He's there. And it's just so beautiful, so encouraging. And that feeling of being close with Christ. I mean, you may feel it in uh, worship, times of worship or prayer. And it's just the most beautiful thing in the world. Pure love. God is love. Being near Him is just so great. So different from this world. Such a beautiful thing. So let's just uh, let's be willing to, to do that, to throw away our old self and to not look back and to, you know, not to stay in this uncomfortable place 
of being still, I mean, we're still in the world. We're not of the world, but we're still here. We're still in the flesh. We're not of the flesh, but we're still here. We're in an un uncomfortable place, but we need to not become comfortable there. We need to uh, keep moving forward towards Christ, okay, in the Spirit. And the Holy Spirit will enable you to do it. So let's keep, keep going. Keep drawing close to Him. Draw close to Him, and He will draw close to you. Almighty God, thank You for speaking to us through Your Word and through the Holy Spirit. Encourage us daily, Lord God. Let us know You more and more. Let us be filled with joy, peace, and love. Let our lives be changed day by day. Let us embrace our new life, our spiritual life, which we receive when we are born again in Christ. Fill us with the Holy Spirit. Strengthen us, Lord God, in our fight against our flesh and strengthen us for spiritual warfare. Convict each of us of our sin. Let us be forgiven for those sins and let us repent of those sins. Please God do amazing, big, powerful things in our lives. And those who don't yet know Christ, we pray that you would draw them to Christ and let them come to know Christ and let them make the choice. But we pray that more and more and as many as possible would accept the gift of salvation through Jesus Christ and receive the Holy Spirit and start living this true Christian life, which is a personal relationship with you, Almighty God. God, we pray that you do amazing things in our lives, through our lives. Let your work be done and make us your obedient servants, we pray. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.